understanding noise pollution and uh, seismic air guns and their impacts on marine life. Um, okay, so just wanted to introduce our lab at USCB. Um, we, uh, we have a, the Marine Sensory Neurobiology Lab and uh, we focus our work on neuroimaging of marine mammals and hearing of fish in marine mammals. And right now we're mostly focusing on acoustic communication and soundscape ecology. Um, we do a lot of applied work and we do, uh, which, which focuses on noise pollution, um, climate change, um, effects of chemical pollutants and marine toxins on, on marine organisms. If you have questions during this talk, since it's such a small crowd, just feel free to, to voice your, your question and, I'll, and we can go from there, okay? Um, so I wanna introduce you to our lab. This is our team. Without these people, we wouldn't do, be doing anything. And I really have a great team of people. Um, Agnesha Monksack is our lab manager and she's in the back there and she's with her little child, Gusta. And our field manager, Bradshaw McKenney, is here and he really runs all the field work in our, in our lab. He was a USCB student um, and now a, a field manager in our lab. And they do great work and they manage and help with uh, our graduate students. We have graduate students at the College of Charleston now, uh, uh, Melissa Marion, so our first graduate student. And hopefully we can transfer those graduate students to the College of Charleston soon. Um, and we also have uh, bioacoustic interns, Jamili and Eva. So we're really stoked to have them on board here. And then of course our USCB students, Ashley Cedar, uh, Jake Morgenstern, Shanil Vivek, Austin Roller, and Caleb Shett. So we have quite a big team of people working in our lab now. Okay. Um, so what happened here was uh, Al Seegers approached me to, to give a talk um, due to uh, the fact that, actually Jody Hayward, Chris Keirer, and, and Al Seegers, Dr. Al Seegers approached me to talk about noise pollution in, uh, in light of Trump's America First offshore energy strategy, um, really to resume the evaluation of permits to conduct seismic exploration surveys in the Atlantic Ocean. Currently, there are eight companies that have submitted application to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, okay? And uh, as you will see in this talk, seismic air guns are loud and they can impact marine life, um, all the way from invertebrates to fish to marine mammals, okay? And uh, we really think there's really a greater need for the public and the scientists and policymakers to really understand noise pollution impacts in marine life. We're so focused a lot of times on environmental chemicals and pollutants where, where we, we sometimes don't have a quite understanding of, of uh, what noise can do and how it can interact with marine life. Okay, so they approached me and here I am. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about introduction to sound in the sea. And then I'll focus on noise pollution and impacts on marine life. And then uh, move on to proposed seismic exploration in the mid and south Atlantic planning area. And then sort of end with our soundscape and noise research at USCB. Okay. Okay. Come on in. <laughs> you haven't missed much. Maybe like just the introduction, which you know anyways. All right, um, so let's talk about introduction to sound in the sea. All right, so how do you characterize sound? So I put this slide out there for a lot of you folks that might not understand uh, sound and, and noise and how to measure it. Um, most of the time you're familiar with, you know, two different characteristics. Loudness, which is how loud something is, um, and pitch, right? But with regards to how scientists measure sound, we really measure loudness as sound pressure level, or SPL. And Aga can tell you all about sound pressure level and SPL. Um, and frequency, which is related to pitch. And so 
they have different units of sound pressure level in air versus water. So in air, um, we refer to it as decibels, RE 20 micropascals, and in water, dB RE 1 micropascal. So what you have to remember that is that sound intensity given in decibels in air is not directly comparable to sound intensity given in decibels in water. Okay, so it's different. Um, and sound travels really fast in water. We're talking, you know, 1,500 meters per second as compared to air where it travels, you know, 345 meters per second. So sound travels long distances underwater without losing energy, right? And so therefore, organisms like blue whales have capitalized on this can, and can communicate across ocean basins, all right? So that's how you characterize sound, and you have to remember, you know, we have these units in hertz or kilohertz, okay? And decibels is a logarithmic scale, so that's important to know as well. I'm not going to go into any more details of that, but if you have questions, just let me know. So how is underwater sound measured? Well, you know, originally, back in the day, we, we, we just had hydrophones and pocket recorders, and hydrophones are like an underwater microphone, right? Now, um, technology has moved to where we have these long-term acoustic recorders that we can deploy in the marine environment. And Cornell has these big instruments that you can deploy in the sea that are just really robust. But, you know, you want to buy that, our instruments cost like $10,000. Where you know, these are, you know, our acoustic recorders that we get in the, you know, they're, they're not that much. They're about between three and 5000 okay? But the cool thing about these recorders is that they have a, a little computer and they have, um, here's your little hydrophone and they have a little computer and you download the data on an SD card and it, you know, creates a wave file and that's what you're working with, okay? And they, they can be deployed continuously for long term with a really, uh, with whatever duty cycle you, you prefer. For example, we use two minutes every 20 minutes. So that means we get a two minute wave file recorder turns on on the hour and then it turns off um, it, you know and then it comes back on every 20 minutes and that's what you're left with you've got some a lot of data one thing you have to realize though is that there's a difference between source levels right we, or sound pressure levels measured at one meter right and that's just usually the lingo that bioacousticians use to really say well how loud is something so you always measure it at a one meter distance. Most of the time when you're deploying these instruments, you're getting received levels, right? Just what that is, is coming to that hydrophone. So you have a, a little oyster toadfish over here making some sounds, but we really don't know how far away that toadfish is, but we get an idea of how you know, loud it is. And you can use, you can use uh, cylindrical spreading loss models and spherical spreading loss models to get an idea of source sound sources, if you know the distance of how far that organism or that boat is from your recorder. So how are sounds viewed and analyzed? Okay, so you have to realize that these hydrophones, they're based on a, most hydrophones are based on what we call a piezoelectric transducer that basically generates electricity when subjected to a pressure change. So you you have a time domain, so this is time, and on the y-axis you get a measure in voltage. And then you can convert that based upon your hydrophone sensitivity to a sound pressure level value, okay? And if you do a fast Fourier transform, which is a, just don't worry about that language, you get a spectrogram, okay? Which is a picture of sound. And, you know, here it's time on the x-axis and on the y-axis is frequency. Um, does anybody know what organism this is that's making this sound? Somebody's got to know. Nobody in my lab. Snapping shrimp. snapping shrimp. Exactly. These are snapping shrimp. And so when bioacousticians look at this, they see a frequency bandwidth that goes all the way from 50 hertz to 40 kilohertz. So it's a big frequency bandwidth. 
and they have a, a certain sound pressure level. Um, and that sound pressure level can vary across the frequency bandwidth. We can actually narrow in on this little pulse and tell you how loud that pulse is. Yes? So, like, how does the physical environment affect the sound pressure level? Yeah, they do. So basically, if you had rock bass versus soft sediment bass, would it would it alter the receiving? It would alter the received sound pressure level potentially. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's really complicated physics. Yeah. But you know, it de generally, what happens as as you know, sound. Um, Sound pressure is impacted by temperature and salinity. All right. So, and you know, those profiles exist in the literature, and I can show those to you if you want. They're all based upon density too. And I'll, I'm going to get to that in just a sec. Yeah. So if you wanted to play this, so this is a, and we know that the, the sea is not silent. There are tons of animals that make sound and use sound to communi communicate acoustically. And one of these is just snappy. I'll play this, this little uh, clip for you. Most of you have heard this. It just sounds like Rice Krispies. Okay. Um, all right, and we also, other organisms that produce sound, fish make sounds too. Um, in our estuarine soundscapes, which we've done a lot of work, we have many sound producing fish species. For example, cyanids here, this is an example of a spotted sea trout. Spotted sea trout are just getting ready to call right now. Um, their chorus has a peak bandwidth, probably between 100 and 500 hertz, around 100 to 500 hertz and the maximum sound pressure level is about 142 decibels that we usually get from a, from a, a chorus of spotted sea trout. And this is what they sound like here, right there. Um, so all this energy here, that's all a spotted sea trout chorus. How many fish? We don't know. We're actually trying to work on that. Um, and all, of course, the endangered North Atlantic right whale, all marine mammals, um, sound is very important to their life, whether it's adonocetes, tooth whales, or mysticetes, baleen whales. They all rely on sound to communicate acoustically. So, for example, the endangered North, North Atlantic right whale, of which there's about 451 individuals right currently, um, you know, they produce different sounds. This is a moan. I'll play a moan for you. This is an up call right here. And up calls are used um, up calls are used by right whales as uh, they're, they're sort of like contact calls. Um, you know, it, and it, it's like a short whoop sound. Um, that rises from about 50 hertz to all the way about uh, 440 hertz and lasts about two seconds. They're, off, they're called contact calls, and they function as signals uh, that basically you know, bring whales together. Um, and then you also, oops, sorry about that. You have uh, the other type of call is a scream call here. Okay, so they rely heavily upon sound. If you guys ever want to check out all the different types of marine mammal sounds, you can go to the Watkins Marine Mammal Sound Database, which Bill Watkins was a great bioacoustician at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and he has a, a plethora of data from archive data from years ago, and this data actually said is becoming really important because it's showing uh, people how 
these calls have changed over the last 50 to 60 years, right? And that's, I'm going to get to that more as really an adaptation to the increased amount of noise in our oceans. All right, so let's move into noise pollution and impacts on marine life, okay? So if we look at human-generated noise in our coastal waters and oceans, what we have to realize is that there are lots of sources of noise. Every, and the way I've organized these photos is it goes from high sound pressure level, the highest sound pressure levels to the lowest. So this is highest to the lowest. And I have another slide. Chemical explosives are associated with, you know, torpedoes and other bombs. Okay? Seismic exploration is next. And we know what those are, where seismic air guns are used to look at the sea bottom, and I'll talk more about that, get an idea of whether or not there's gas or oil or other geological uh, you know, reserves underneath our sediment in our ocean floors. There's sonar, uh, Navy sonar, um, including mid-frequency active sonar and low-frequency active sonar. Okay. Pile drive. Anytime. <laughs> Jamili's looking at me because her, her husband works for uh, a company that does a lot of pile driving. Okay, so anytime you build a dock, you've got a big jackhammer and it's pounding that big piling into the sediment and it is loud. Okay, it, I'll get to that. It causes mortality in fish. And they're doing that right now in Beaufort County. Uh, right down at Beaufort Dock with no regulations of what's happening to the acoustic environment or what happens to the fish. That's what I'm saying. Noise is not very regular. Uh, and this is what we need to think about. Offshore drilling, acoustic harassment devices. Acoustic harassment devices are now devices that people have, fishermen use a lot of these, to keep seals and other marine mammals away from their nets. And they're loud. They're, they're called seal ex exclusion devices. I can, I can give you all these photos. Now, the ones in yellow, that are outlined in yellow, those are the things that are within our soundscape, within estrin soundscapes, OK? Other examples of human-generated noise in our coastal waters and oceans include container ships, bulk carriers, tankers, inboard engines, outboard engines. I didn't include jet skis. They're here, too. Offshore windmills. So all of these, the windmills, have the lowest noise sound pressure level. Okay, so that's a good thing. They're hard on birds, but they don't pollute, pollute the environment with noise. Right. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go. This is a busy slide, but I want to talk a little bit about this to you. So this is sound intensity of underwater noise. And so the way I've organized this is above the red dotted line is basically sounds produced by explosives, seismic air guns, low frequency active sonar, mid frequency active sonar. Um, it's so intense that it can directly injure animals in the immediate vicinity. So the U US, hold on, I want to read this for you guys and not mess this up. The U.S. regulators require that such sound sources be shut down if a marine mammal might enter the zone of potential injury. Okay, so you're talking about sound source levels, explosives of 304 decibels, RE, one micropascal at one meter. Seismic air guns are 220 to 260 decibels. Low frequency active sonar, mid frequency active sonar are about 235 decibels. And this is the bandwidth. So that's the frequency range of this noise surface. And this is the exposure duration. I won't go into it. But seismic air guns um, occur, this gun, and I'll tell you more about it at the end of the talk, it occurs every 15 seconds and it can occur for weeks. Okay? 220 to 260 decibels. Okay? Um, so above this purple dotted line, uh, current U.S. regulations state that SBLs above 180 decibels pose a risk of injury to whales and dolphins. So that includes 
pile driving, offshore drilling, container ships, bulk carriers, and tankers. Okay, and they're they're loud, you know. And and if you go to Charleston, we have a project now. You're talking about container ships that are producing source sound pressure levels of 188 decibels, 187. Okay, um, and then finally our inboard engines, and off and outboard engines, you know, can range anywhere from 150 to 180 decibels. Um, I'm not going to go into all the bandwidths here, but a lot of these noise so sources are lower frequency. Okay, so the more of a challenge for baleen whales and fish than they are for adonisids. But there are some issues. So, you know, what, for example, seismic air guns, I, you know, right here it goes 0.05 to, to 3 kilohertz. It was thought previously that it only went to 300 hertz, but recent measurements are showing that it goes up to 3 kilohertz, and in some cases up to 15 kilohertz. Okay. Um, and here, above the brown dotted line, U.S. Regula re regulations also establish criteria for disrupting behavior, just disrupting behavior, and they set that 160 decibels um, can disrupt the behavior of whales and dolphins. So it's even possible that inboard and outboard engines can disrupt the behavior of marine mammals. Okay. And so to give you, uh, let's go down here. Oops. So just to give you an example of how this is with regards, this is the sort of the lowest sound pressure level of these, of these. Uh, here, this is an outboard engine, and this is some measurements that we, we took when we were trying to get sound, uh, source sound pressure levels of a 90 horsepower Yamaha four-stroke. And uh, the, the sound is so loud that it actually clipped our hydrophones, so we're actually having to use less sensitive hydrophones. So we're trying to get, you know, so you'll hear this sound. And so you... And this is at 35 miles per hour, 5,200 RPMs at, um, at a distance of one meter. And these are the different decibel values for different frequency bandwidths. Okay, so that's only 150, approximately 150 decibels. All right, so think about what 220 or 260 decibels is like. All right. So impacts of noise and marine life. So I... You know, with the help of Eva and Aga, we've really done a good summary of about 103 research articles and reviews. Um, and we sort of organized it into five different types of effects. Mortality, damage to hearing, anatomy, sensory structures, effects on development, um, stress, physiology, behavior, and masking. Okay? So we're going to go through each one of these and provide some, some illustrations of how noise causes mortality and all these other effects. So the first evidence that noise impacted marine life was really the link between mil military sonar exercises and the strandings of deep whales. And this was a paper that was published in Nature in 1991, where strandings occurred when naval ships were in the area. And then that, that sort of the evidence wasn't exactly concrete, but then in, in Greece, there was a, a series of beak whale strandings occurred when military sonars broadcasted at 226 decibels at 600 and 300 hertz, and that was published in Nature. And then since then, there's been uh, strandings associated with beak whales in the Can Canary Islands and in the Bahamas. And one of my, uh, I know a lot of the folks that did a lot of this work and, and what the, the going, one of the going theories and why beak whales are so sensitive is that for some reason, so for example, this paper was published in, in Nature in 2003. Um, there were 14 beak whales that stranded in 2002 in the Canary Islands and it's of the Xiphius and Mesoplodon genus, beak whales. Um, they did eight necropsies on different, and eight necropsies on eight different whales, obviously. 
Um, and what they noted was vi microvascular hemorrhages with fat emboli present. So here are some bubbles in the liver, and this is the histological section. And they actually state that marine, you would think that marine mammals would be resistant to de decompression sickness, but they're not. Um, they actually think that this bubble formation is in response to sonar exposure. It might really be a result from behavioral changes to their normal dive profile. So it's kind of like they, they, they have like a, a, a stopover and they hang out in that little place for the water column quickly, but what's happening here is that they have this accelerated ascent rate and they rush to the surface and they basically, you know, they get the bends, okay? And so this is the going theory on why um, marine mammals may, may have such an issue, especially beak whales with, uh, with uh, Navy sonar. This is a very interesting so again, sticking in mortality, this is a really interesting paper. And I forward this to the invertebrates biologists here in our department, Steve Borgnini and Joe. And seismic surveys actually cause significant mortality to zooplankton populations. Okay, and you know, we know that zooplankton forms the basis of oceanic food chains. So this paper was published by Robert McCauley, who's really a, you know, he's, he does a lot of great work in noise. Um, and he showed that widely used marine seismic surveys, air gun operations negatively impact zooplankton. So they had an experimental air gun exposure in the southern Tasmania, and it decreased zooplankton abundance um, when compared to controls as measured by active acoustics and net toes. There was actually a 64% decrease in just one hour, okay? And impacts were observed out to the maximum of 1.2 kilometers from the source, right? All larval krill were killed after air gun passage. And at 1.2 kilometers from the air gun, the sound pressure was still only 178 decibels. And so there's some going theory that it actually, the seismic air gun, um, create such high sound pressure levels that it affects the statocyst and the statolith of different zooplankton. And it causes hemorrhaging and they die. And so here is some, I have this paper and you can, I can give you all the references if needed. So kill zooplankton. Um, pile driving, okay, so effects of exposure to pile driving can be lethal to fish. So this is a brilliant study that was done by Michelle Halverson and colleagues in Art Popper's group. And uh, again, pile driving is basically you have the big piles and you, you blast them into the, the bottom. You know, they're doing it in Beaufort. Um, and they chose three different species as sort of an idea and they experimentally exposed them to pile driving sounds. They chose a lake sturgeon, Nile palapia, and hog choker. And they chose these because they have different swim bladder, swim bladder configurations, right? So a lake sturgeon has an open swim bladder, meaning that has like a mouth, you know, it's got, oh, that, that gas can escape, okay? And it's called a physostomous swim bladder. Tilapia have a, has a closed swim bladder or physoclistic swim bladder. And hog chokers, as we know, they don't have a swim bladder. And so they expose at 174 to 186 decibels a single strike pile drive noise, 960 strikes, caused massive hemorrhaging, in, uh, called moderate hemorrhaging in lake surgeon in the swim bladder and associated organs like the liver, et cetera. Nile tilapia, severe hemorrhage, and, and the hog choker, no injury. So it's very important to understand the type of swim bladder that's present in fish when they're exposed to noise because certain species might be more or less sensitive based upon their swim bladder structure, okay? And re one thing you have to remember is that seismic air guns are similar to pile driving is that they're intense impulses, okay? So let's talk about d damage to hearing anatomy and sensory structures, okay? So 
really, during the 1990s, the U.S. Office of Naval Research supported the development of new methods to define levels of sound exposure that affected marine mammals. And so they had to come up with techniques to study the hearing of marine mammals. Um, this is a common technique that we've used in the past, and we published this paper in um, the Journal of Experimental Biology, where we wanted to learn more about the hearing and hearing anatomy of a pygmy killer whale. So you, first of all, you're going to ask yourself, how do you do hearing tests on marine mammals? Right? Well, you have to remember that marine mammals, they don't have ears. Right? So how does they get sound to their inner ear? They use a lower jaw that channels, has fat, and it channels sound to their inner ear and their typanic bullet. And so what you do is you create a jaw phone. You have a jaw phone here that goes against that, that little area, that little jaw. And then you have these recording electrodes here, and you measure the brain's response to acoustic stimulus. Okay? And it's called an auditory evoked potential. Right? And so what you do is you play these, uh, you choose one frequency, right? And let's say you expose them to one fre frequency like 40 kilohertz, and you create a very high sound pressure level, and you decrease that sound pressure level to the, you don't see the brain's squiggle, you know, brain's response to the acoustic stimulus. And so you can see this is at 126 decibels at 40 kilohertz, 120 at 140 kilohertz, so you decrease the sound level until the brain's not really responding to that acoustic stimulus. And right there, that's your hearing threshold. Okay? And you do that for a bunch of frequencies, and then you plot the threshold in which they don't hear, and you get a U-shaped audiogram that indicates, okay, here is a region of the best sensitivity. All right? So for most sodonocetes, tooth whales, their best for hearing range is about 40 kilohertz. Okay? And, you know, they, they do have the lowest hearing thresholds between 20 and 60 kilohertz, okay? So what scientists have done in order to understand how these noise levels and how these different frequencies affect the hearing of marine mammals, and this became very important with regards to understanding the risk of noise associated with seismic air guns, mid-frequency active sonar or low-frequency active sonar, they, um, they do this sort of playback experiment with these sounds. And what can happen when you're exposed to intense sound, it, can, may, it may cause an increased hearing threshold. And that's called a noise-induced threshold shift. Okay? And if the hearing threshold returns to normal, then an NITS is called a temporary threshold shift. So temporary, a, a little temporary loss of hearing. So the recovery time is a function of the magnitude of the temporary threshold shift. And it's really, time, that's the time it takes for the hearing to actually recover. Okay? So if you have questions, just let me know. If that hearing threshold does not return to normal, then the remaining NITS is called a permanent threshold shift. And that's basically that that animal is now probably permanently deaf. Okay? And so, what had happened is that, you know, a lot of scientists, especially from Jim Finneran's group um, and uh, Castellin's group, they looked, they did playback experiments for different sounds. For example, seismic air guns, low frequency, mid frequency active sonar, and pile driving. And they used model species like the harbor porpoise or bottlenose dolphin. You can't create, and notice the sound pressure levels. They're not really, really loud because Logistically and legally, you, you know, you can't cause a permanent threshold shift. But they were interested in, in understanding, like, wh what are the levels that cause a, a temporary threshold shift, right? And what happens, seismic air guns, as low as a sound pressure level of 199.7, not, not 220, 260, that causes a temporary shift at 4 kilohertz. So that means at 4 kilohertz, for where they're hearing, they lose their hearing. And they lose it for greater than 29 hours. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why when a seismic air gun ship is in the vicinity of marine mammals, they shut their operation down. Right? But they, are, they operate 
continuously, even in the fog and at night, when you can't, you don't have marine mammal observers. So there's always that risk. And remember, fish can't, fish can't run, especially your snapper group, grouper complex, which I'll get to. So the ecological si significance of temporary threshold shift is that it really depends upon the magnitude of that temporary threshold shift, how much hearing have they lost, uh, it depends upon the duration of the recovery, like how long does that hearing actually recover, and the hearing frequency at which the temporary threshold shift occurs. I mean, it might be right in their echolocation range, which is a, ba a bad thing, because they can't hear the returning echo, or they can't communicate with their um, conspecifics. This is an issue. So temporary threshold may have profound effects on foraging, communication, predator detection and navigation. Yes, Steve. Right. But that, that's called masking. And we're going to get to that. So, you know, the lo louder the background noise, the harder it is to hear individuals. And they actually try to figure that out by looking at critical um, band ratios, so signal to noise ratios. So they, 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 measure, they try to figure that out based upon the communication range or the source sound pressure level of the vocalization that they're producing. And then what's the background noise and how much above the signal is that of that background noise. Right, right, right. Well, you know, that, the background noise is loud, you know, and that's the whole thing. You know, some mammals may know how to handle, some marine mammals may know how to handle loud background noise. It may not be an issue for them. But not 220 and 260 decibels, that's really loud. That's dangerous for an animal. It will blow their hearing range. The, the you know, the, the stereocilia will, will shear, and then the hair cell bundles will, will pretty much... You know, it'll cause a lot of problems. Yes, Chris or, or, or whoever. That's a right, right. That's challenging because it's really hard to, to like you know we tried to understand hearing uh, variability in a population of bottlenose dolphins and ONR wouldn't fund it. They're more interested in pelagic species. They're more exposed to mid frequency and low frequency active sonar. So that's a really you got to catch the animal. You know, it's not an easy thing to do. It's almost like you really can't get those data, and that's why they've really chosen the route of doing playback experiments. And the ethical issues, you can't cause a permanent threshold shift. So you have to measure it with regards to temporary threshold shift. And look at recovery. How long does it recover? And then, you know, do some sort of modeling. All right. And, and try to predict what will happen if you increase it by 10 dB, by 20 dB, by 30, by 40, right? They already know, though, that you, within a certain range, you, you know, they shut down active sonar, mid-frequency and low-frequency, and they shut down seismic air guns. So the industry already knows that, hey, this is, and, and government knows this is cause hearing loss in strandings and marine mammals. So they, they don't want to do that because, you know, they're protected in the Marine Mammal Protection Act and they're going to get sued. So, does that help? Yes, Wes. Okay, so you said that the magnitude of the sound and the distance mm -hmm. the speed at which that sound travels through the water. Mm -hmm. If you've got a sonar unit, let's just say you've got a seismic air gun. Right. How far away from that impact? Right. 
what's the range? What's the range at which animals would be safe? Right. Let's say at 220. Right. You, you know, I can't answer that question right offhand. I'd have to look at the, the models. But what you're trying to say is that what's the received sound pressure level at that animal's source and how far away does it propagate? Um, I'm going to get a little bit more to that in a second on a study. If the notion is that people are at least, I mean, seven. Spotting animals in right. Them, that you can see them just too close. Right. We know that that's. But the issue is, is like, I. Right. Yeah, no, it's more than that. Yeah, I'll give you an example, and I'll get to it. Um, there are issues with, with at least seven kilometers away. So if you looked at, for example, back to this study right here, I mean, they had uh, mortality of zooplankton at out to the maximum 1.2 kilometers from the source. So that's like at least, what, how many miles is that? About one mile? A little less than one mile. So at least one mile away, it was killing zooplankton. OK. So there's that. We'll get to that, though, because there's another study that I want to talk to you all about with regards to fish that kind of gets to, it's at least seven kilometers. And it, basically, what you've got to do is you can just determine, you can use the source sound pressure level of 220 and 260, and then you can do a cylindrical spreading loss model and just figure out at what distance the sound pressure li level is. And we can, I should have done that for you, but I could, you know, we could do that in the lab quickly, kind of give you a guesstimate, but there's going to be variability around that measurement. Okay. Yes, it does. Yep. All right, so this is an interesting study. Uh, seismic air guns damaged fish ears. So they had pink snapper held in cages, and they were exposed to signals from a seismic air gun in Gervais Bay, Western Australia. The received sound pressure level at the cage was 150 to 100 decibels, 20 to 1,000 hertz. Very sensitive for fish, because fish hearing, fish hear best between 50 hertz and 1,000 hertz. Usually it's about 500 hertz. So they're very sensitive to seismic air gun sounds because it's, it's pretty much all within their hearing range. Okay? And they saw damage to sensory epithelia. No repair up to 50 day, 58 days after, which is strange because fish can repair their hair cells unlike mammals. Okay? They can regenerate new hair cells where marine mammals cannot. So this is a big issue right here. Effects on development. So noise can affect development. And I just, just this just stuns me. Um, this was published in scientific reports. New Zealand scallop larvae were exposed to playbacks of seismic pulses. Uh, the received sound pressure level is about 164 dB not nearly at the 220 to 260 <laughs> dB, and it showed significant development delays and 40%, 46% developed body abnormalities in the D. Belliger phase. And what they saw was localized bulges in the soft body. Okay, so this was really interesting. The other thing that they showed was that motorboat noise impacts the, patern the paternal parental behavior and offspring survival in a reef fish in the spiny chromis. So this exposure to motorboat noise playback increased defensive act and reduced both feeding and offspring interactions by brood guarding males. So these males, they guard their brood, right? But noise reduced the likelihood of offspring survival. In fact, offspring survived at all 19 nests exposed to just ambient sound, but six out of 19 nests exposed to noise suffered complete brood mortality. So this was a really, so what's happening a lot in the literature now is this is just blooming with studies, um, and especially with folks in Australia, uh, Stephen Simpson's group, really showing that noise impacts from boats impacts fish. Yes. 
Don't know that yet. That's a good question. We can test that. Right. Yeah. I think what we need to do is eventually just create quieter engines. And it's doable. It's doable. We just have to push the technology. You know, and I think that might happen as we start realizing that noise pollution is a bigger deal than we thought it was. You know. And it gives, you know, engineers something to do and and uh it just drives the economy towards a more sustainable way of living. Because I mean, you'll, see, you know, and I might be getting too long here if I let me know because I don't want to go overboard. There's other development studies. I'm not going to go into them. If you want to see them, I'm, I was just, I was just stunned, especially with the sea hair. Interesting work. Stress physiology and behavior. Um, Seismic surveys negatively affect humpback whale singing activity off northern Angola. Roger Payne is a big guru. He discovered, discovered that humpback whales sing. And uh, I've actually worked with Roger back in the day. I worked on his Whale Conservation Institute boat off of Gloucester, Massachusetts. That, he's a really interesting guy. Um, but this uh, Salvatore Sergio, I know him, and he he uh, deployed recorders off of northern Angola. They had, uh, looked at seismic survey pulses range from 111 to 156 dB. The peak frequency was 15 to 406 hertz. And singers basically, there was decreased with increasing received seismic sound pressure levels. So as the seismic sound pressure levels increased, the number of males singing decreased. All right? So, Breeding display was disrupted. And you're talking about animals like humpbacks that are trying to communicate with each other over, over hundreds of miles, probably potentially, you know, maybe thousands, all right? Especially with blue whales with infrasonic sound. So other studies uh, report seismic surveys disrupt cetacean behavior, bowhead whales, sperm whales, beluga whales, fin whales, uh, everywhere from the Arctic to the Gulf and to the Mediterranean, and they involve changing, changes in surface respiration, avoidance, call cessation, um, buzz feeding, rate decline, temporary displacement, altered singing, habitat abandonment. So obviously sound bothers you. Okay. This is all reviewed in Novacek et al. 2015. If you're interested in looking at the literature further. This gets back to your question. So seismic surveys noise disrupted fish use of a temperate reef. This was just published in 2017 by Avery Paxton and one of my colleagues, Douglas Novacek, is a co-author. And they used, they had an opportunistic monitoring of a seismic survey off North Carolina in 2014. This was not for oil exploration. This was an act, the academic objective was to study the formation and evolution of Eastern North American margins. And uh, this is the track line for the size of the air zone. And it had um, two hydrocells here, 27 kilometers and 6.5 kilometers. And then they had a video recorder on car bottoms that sustained basically a snapper of super contact near the top of the survey. Uh, this is what they found. So noise level on the reef with video they did not have a hydrogen, okay? Uh, but the estimated received sound pressure level is about 181 to 220 decibels. And basically, this is one day prior to the seismic survey, this is during the seismic survey. So basically, the fish abundance is going to be low for the entire time. So the noise levels on the reef to the hydrophone were greater than 170 decibels. And the estimate levels at 0.7 kilometer reef were about 202 to 230 decibels. So this is a concern because mortal injuries occur at noise levels greater than 207 decibels. The fish is yes. You want to go to this under the data? Okay, I've got a figure. Oh, here I'll show you. 
Yeah, let's talk afterwards. I, I, I kind of, I don't want to, I probably just lost my place. These are just extra slides for you all. I'll go back to that. I think they did it up to, uh, 50, I don't know how long they went afterwards. I'll have to check on that. I'm good. Okay, so the last thing I want to touch upon is masking. And, and Steve m talked about masking previously. Auditory masking is basically a perceptual interference of one sound, a communication signal by another, often referred to as noise. So an impact for a receiver depends on the spectral overlap and the amplitude of the noise. So that means basically, does that noise overlap in frequency to the, no to the sound that the animal is trying to communicate at? And if it does, you know, how, how, much, what's, how much louder is that noise compared to the source level of that communicator, right? So for example, red drum or males are trying to make sound to, and to bring females to a spawning location, right? Well, how much does that noise impact their, you know, does it cause range reduction in terms of their communication active space? And also, is there an information loss, which is really important because some species are basically using their acoustic signal as a way to say, hey, who's the, who's the biggest male? I want to mate with that male, right? And you lose that information, okay, through noise. It's a really important problem. This is one of the things that we are very interested in. But you do have a Lombard effect. So it's known that animals can alter their vocalizations when exposed to noise. So, and that's known as the Lombard effect, um, in, invented by, I think it's a French scientist in 1911. And it's an anti-masking st strategy. And you see this in beluga whales with beluga whales that are exposed to noise in the St. Lawrence River estuary. Um, they actually increase their vocalization amplitude. So they basically talk louder. Um, for dolphins that are exposed to noise in Tamp Tampa Bay, Florida, uh, my colleague in his lab showed that bottlenose dolphins increase their frequency of their whistles to avoid masking. So they basically change their frequency above the noise frequency. The noise frequency is sort of lower. They start talking a little bit louder. Not louder, a frequency, a higher frequency. So it doesn't overlap. And uh, noise from a whale watch boat in Washington state, killer whales increase their call duration in the presence of boat noise. So they just basically are more redundant. They have to repeat themselves. But these animals are really intelligent. They've learned how to figure out with noise. They've probably been exposed to the ambient noise their whole time, and they figure out how to deal with it. So this is an anti-masking strategy. But yet it's a behavioral adaptation that they have to deal with, OK? So let me uh, go on to propose, and if, if I need to stop, let me know. Um, I've, this is probably, uh, we're almost at the tail end here. I don't know how overboard I am, probably about. Right. right, okay. All right, all right, so here's, well, let's talk about the plan, the proposed seismic exploration in the mid and south Atlantic planning area. So. This is the currently submitted applications for GNG activities in the Atlantic. So that's geophysical and geological, i.e. seismic exploration for oil and gas. There are roughly eight companies. Uh, these are permits are under review right now. And these are the different companies. You can look at all these applications at the BOEM website right here. I can provide that for you. Um, so these are your, your companies, and they're proposing to go and, and do a lot of, lot, a lot, a lot of, a, like roughly, I think, I was talking to my colleague, Doug Novacek, and he knows more along the lines of what their plan is, but it's something like 900 survey days in a year. I was like, well, how, I don't understand, there's only 100, 365 days, but that's multiple companies, all right? And it's hundreds of survey tracks, hundreds of shots. It would, I could see the, you know, so this is a magnet. This is very. This is a big magnitude. That's what I've heard. But I'm not 100% sure. So that's something that we, you know, I I don't have the data for that. These are areas for each company. 
Okay, so for example, ABI, ABI Holdings Limited, E18001, I'm sure some of us may have stocks in these companies. And, you know, this is purple. This is where they, that company wants to have their permit to use their seismic air guns to look at the ocean floor. Okay. These little squares, I think, are just um, quadrants that Bohm uses. Okay. All right, so basic application of seismic data acquisition in a marine setting. So what happens is they shoot an air gun, a source of shock waves, with basically this, this little gun, and it produces a big, loud sound, and it bounces off the bottom. Well, it hits the bottom and bounces back, and, and they have all these hydrophones there. And so essentially, they're just trying to determine whether or not there's water, porous reservoir, rock, or oil, or gas based upon how that sound bounces back and the frequency and the sound pressure level of it, they can actually model what's below the sea floor. Right. Um, so when you think about animals that are at risk off of our continental shelf, this is a great paper. This was just published um, this past year, or actually not this past year, in 2016 by Jason Roberts, um, which he's a part of the Duke Geospatial Marine Lab. Um, I have a couple colleagues on that, you know, Tim Cole, he's my best friend up in, in uh, he runs a right whale aerial program and he's a good surf buddy of mine. He directed me towards this paper. This is a really, and Bill McClellan and Dan, uh, Ann Paps, they're at UNC Wilmington. This is a really good paper for you all to know. Um, to understand cetacean abundance off of our coastline. But in a nutshell, the big, you know, the animals of the largest abundance are, are bottlenose dolphins, offshore pelagic animal bottlenose dolphins, which are different from our resident stocks or even our migrants, right? Atlantic spotted dolphins and, of course, the North Atlantic right whale. And the North Atlantic right whale, if you, you can go to this website and they can actually, they'll show you the distribution of the right whale at different times of the year. And during December, January, February, and March, North Atlantic right whale is having calves off of our coast. Okay, so off of southern South Carolina, Georgia, and northern Florida. So this species is at risk, okay? And they're endangered, there's about 451 animals left. The other thing that um, I think is actually more worrisome with sound pressure levels as high is uh, our live hard bottom habitats, which um, support our snapper grouper complex. Um, and there are tons of species of, 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 of fish out in these snapper uh, grouper off this live bottom habitats, including you know, family Ballastae, family Carangidae, the family Humilidae, and the family Buchanidae, all your, all your snappers. These are all in ye outlined in yellow. They, sound is very important to them in their life cycle. So it's very important, similar to all your cyanids, okay? Um, all your tilefish and your black belly rosefish, all your family sparidae, and, um, and most important, I think, uh, is your grouper complex, your family serenidae, everything from your bank sea bass, your black sea bass, your gag, snowy grouper, red grouper, sand perch, scamp, speckled hind. A lot of these species are in the decline. Um, I got a lot of this data from Marcel Riker, South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Um, so interesting, especially because these fish species all use sound as part of their courtship. They produce courtship sounds, which are very important in their reproductive process. Okay, so these fish, unlike right whales, they're not going to swim away. They can't swim away. They're part of their reef. They're going to go into that nooks and cranny, and, and they're going to be exposed to whatever source sound pressure levels are present. Okay. We actually have a working proposal right now um, with Marcel Reichert, Don Glasgow, and Doug Novacek, and David Mann. We're trying to put... Um, they have this MarMap program where they go out and they put all these chevron traps here uh, aboard the RV Palmetto to learn more about catching the snapper grouper complex and understanding the abundance and diversity and really the, the, the um, reproductive 
where they are in their reproductive strategy, and uh, we're, we're, we're hoping to put some recorders on this. Okay. So that's it. Uh, I'll go quickly over some of the work that we're doing in our lab. And uh, we just got an uh, Aspire II grant to build a USC interdisciplinary team to study the impacts of anthropogenic noise on the behavior of marine organisms. Um, with my expertise in passive acoustics, signal detections expertise from Dr. Xi and Matt Kimmel at USC Baruch, who's doing active acoustics. We're trying to build a team that can really tackle noise-related issues. Um, I'll give you a quick little rundown of some of the local work that we're doing and really interested, interesting, is uh, if you look at this, I know there's a bit of a busy figure, but what we do is we use our acoustics to learn more about the spawning timelines of a variety of different fish species, okay? And everything from oyster toadfish to spotted sea trout to silver birch, black drum, red drum, they all use sound as part of their courtship process, right? And we, we know their spawning timelines. And so here's the date, and here's a, you know, black drum in blue, and here's silver perch, and here's uh, spotted sea trout and oyster toadfish and red drum in the fall. And what you see in red is a number of boats. And this is done at uh, the mouth of the May River. This is the only place in the entire May River that we find a spawning aggregation of red drum. And it's a very noisy area because it's part of the intercoastal waterway. Right, and so all these red lines are boat detections, right? And what we looked at was we looked at how does the boat noise within a day overlap with the courtship calls of different fish species, right? Because fish don't make sound all the time when they're spawning. You know, they have different air times of the day in which they spawn, and that's when they're producing their courtship calls. So if you look at silver perch, here's the time, and this is boat noise, so most of the boat noise is during the day, right? And here's silver perch. There's not as much overlap with silver perch or spotted sea trout, but red drum call more during the day, okay? So they have the most overlap with boat noise. In fact, the aggregation at the mouth of the May River experiences 20% overlap in time with boat noise because of their late afternoon chorus. So it's a really interesting, under, you know, understanding this is sort of interesting in terms of evaluating risk. All right. Oops, it's kind of like freezing here. Oh. So here's a... a Here's a red drum chorus, okay? And that was on September 26, 2017 with no boat noise present. And then what I want to illustrate, I'm not going to play the sound clips, but right here, here's the boat noise chorus. Here's the, the red drum chorus, and then this is the, the boat noise. And you can see it completely bleeds into that chorusing aggregation and uh, elevated the background noise by about 16 decibels, okay? So this is... This could be an issue, you know, we're not sure, but noise may impact reproduction. Um, noise may uh, affect the formation of aggregating males. Oops. Um, noise may affect female attraction to an aggregation, right, because they can't hear the males. Noise may affect information transfer of the male to the female. And noise may affect um, hatching success of embryos and larval development. So we're very interested in pursuing this. So we really want to try to get an idea of how does boat noise impact oyster, toadfish, silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum reproduction. And we've done a lot of uh, what we call float trips where we really find an aggregation using sound. This is up in the May River, and this is for looking for an aggregation of spotted sea trout. And areas where it's really red is the area where there's lots of sound, spotted sea trout sounds. So we've sort of narrowed in on where that aggregation exists. So what we're going to do now is we're going to expose these spawning aggregations to boat noise and just see what happens to their vocalizations. All right? Not a lot of people can do this because they don't have like this sort of aggregation at their fingertips. And that's what we're going to try to do. 
And then a great thing is we have Waddell, the Miller Culture Facility, and we're going to start doing playback experiments. And we're going to, uh, does noise affect juvenile and adult behavior? This is what plan, this is what we have planned for this summer through the Aspire 2 grant. Does noise affect courtship sounds and egg production? And does noise affect hatching success and development? And so we can really start, well, does it affect spotted sea trout development? Does it affect the red drum development? This is novel work that really has not been done. All right. And then our last sort of work that we write down, we have a, a, a proposal with the South Carolina Aquarium, the South Carolina Ports Authority, um, about assessing disturbance from the Charleston Harbor Deepening Project on bottomless dolphins. So this is really integrated with the South Carolina Aquarium. And our PI is Dr. Fair. And one of our colleagues is Dr. David Lusso. And also Megan is, he is helping with this. Um, and we're, we've got uh, six DSG oceans in, in uh, the Charleston Harbor that are deployed. And we're really looking at the impacts of dredging on marine or marine, really mer dolphins. But we're looking at how it might impact fish as well. But what we're realizing is that there's such a difference in the soundscape of an urban area to the May River. And it's really loud there. There's huge carrier ships with 180 decibels. We're actually, in some cases, we're having to switch out hydrophones because it's, it's, uh, our, our hydrophones are actually too sensitive. Um, and so we're looking into seeing how much of a problem that is. But you know, does dredging impact distribution of bottomless dolphins? How does dredging affect the soundscape? How do container ships, tankers, and cruise ships affect the soundscape? So this is, this is work that I think as a whole, we, we don't really have a good idea on how it impacts marine organisms. That's it. Um, do you have questions? Sorry, I went overboard. That was way long. Um, but yeah. So I, I just wanted to give you a, an idea of noise. <coughs> yes, Al. So would this be considered painful? When they're exposed to noise? At, I think, yes, definitely. Anything above, let me think, anything above 170 or 80, I think, would be potentially painful for their ear. I don't know. You know, I don't think we know, like, go ahead, Eva. Eva may know, because she's done a lot of literature search. So listen to Eva, probably more than me. <laughs> hmm. So there's, so it, it, noise may elevate the stress response. And that might be one of the reasons why it's impacting development because that response is stressed. So I think we might under start understanding that noise may cause a problem with development. It might be related to the stress response or it impacts status. It depends. Yeah, Steve. I think, yeah, definitely here. Yeah. Yeah, that might be, I don't, I don't really know how they behave to noise, you know, it's like, the other thing is, that's an issue, and I don't want to belittle the noise issue, but you got to look at both sides, and that's what you should do, but there's a good paper here, not that one, not that one, not that one, this one, repeated exposure to noise increases tolerance in a coral reef fish. So it is possible that certain fish species can tolerate noise, right? Um, they did this study. This was with domino damsel fish. And juvenile dominoes increased hiding behavior during motorboat noise after two days of repeated exposure, but no longer hid after one or two weeks, OK? So naive individuals responded to playback noise with elevated ventilation rates. So they are stressed. That's the stress response in a fish. <laughs> But this response was diminished after one or two weeks of repeated exposures. But again, this is motorboat noise. You know, the decibel levels are about 160, right, dV? Where 220 to 260 is a different ballgame. Well, if, if they're hiding, they're not able, right? They're not, they're, mm -hmm. they're avoiding, unless they're hiding, they can't put it. Right, right. They're not mating. 
Right. But the thing about the snapper group complex offshore is I don't think they really have, the only place they're going to do is they're going to hide. It's not like a marine mammal, they're going to swim away. They're going to burrow into their reef, but they're not going to get much, that's not going to provide them much of a relief from the sound pressure level. I don't know. Unless you, if you could figure that out, you could put some recorders in, inside the bedrock, but I'm sure no, it tra noise will travel through that that uh, those rocks or those crevices and expose the fish to the sound. I, I don't know. I, I, the injury may be lessened. Yes, Chris. Um, the, what would be interesting is maybe the classified outcome of the oil industry is the spacing of the surveys that they're using the sonar. Right. Yeah, I don't know that. You want to know what percent of the area right. is within 7 or 10 kilometers right. you know, of a of a boat. Right. Right. I think I used to take off short. Right. Right. Yeah, I would do that. Because I don't know. I mean, there might be ways to do this work. You know, off the record, I'm against it because I think there are ways to look for, you know, we should be moving towards renewable energy resources like we've been trying to talk about for the last 40 years or 50 years. Doesn't seem to happen. Um, but that's a different topic. But if they're going to potentially use um, seismic air guns to look for oil, you know, you got to think about how to minimize the risk. Right. 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 And I, I hope that Bohm, I'm sure Bohm will take that into consideration. I would hope that they will focus on, like, okay, one company can do this swath, one company do, does this swath. Right. Right. What I've read from, um, so Peter Tyak is a good, great noise. He was at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He's now in uh, the Marine Mammal Center. And uh, where is he? I think he's at in uh, Scotland now. At the last, uh, anyways, we're at St. Andrews. He's at St. Andrews now. But I was reading a review paper, and the way they they ramp it up. So they start just with one gun, right? And then this is just talking about one survey, and they ramp it up. So if there's no marine mammals, then they start firing more guns. Because the more guns you have firing at the same time, the louder it is, and the, I guess the better resolution. This is where I'm vague. I don't know much about this process. I just know what, it does, what noise does to animals. Um, but that's the idea. And then if there's any marine mammals present, they stop. Because they have, they have marine mammals, of bo marine mammal observers are aboard these ships at all times. And, it, and my, my friend, Sheila, she, who is a colleague at University of South Florida, she worked on one of these ships. And they do shut it down, right? But that's not going to help fish or inverts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Picking up much noise off bridge traffic. Mm. In the I don't know. We don't have any bridges in the Bay River. Well, I mean, the hill. Yeah, yeah, that's far. That's a good idea, though. You know, I thought about noise, like the like uh, the the noise that is associated with bridges, just because of the vibrations of the concrete. Um, we probably will be able to address that in our Charleston study, because we have a recorder right, it's right next to Drum Island, right, Bradshaw? Aga, we've got a, a, yeah, it's right, what's that big, it's right next to the Cooper River Bridge. So it's like literally 100 feet from that bridge, 200 feet. So we'll be able to figure out what the noise associated with the bridge traffic is. I don't want to be like a noise snot and say we can't do anything, but we got to understand what it's doing to wildlife because right now it's not associated with any sort of risk assessment. It's, you know, mostly the time we focus on environmental chemicals. We don't think of noise being a pollutant. 
but it is. Yes? How are you going to uh, look at the effects of the third noise on the fish and masking the noise? Are you going to look at it like uh, making clear? Making clear? Well, I think we're going to start simple first. You know, and we're going to first you know, expose, we're going to do some drive-bys at an aggregation, spotted sea trout aggregation. We're hoping to do silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum. Um, and uh, I think we ran, we were wanted to do silver perch this year, but silver perch has already done chorusing, so we missed that season. Uh, we thought it would be later, but it wasn't. But the idea is just to drive a boat uh, right next to the aggregation. Uh, oh, hold on. And then look at the, the first step is just to see if it disrupts chorusing. Yeah, it's a tough question. I don't know how to do that. I haven't given it. I just, you know, we can get an I we can give you an idea of, right. We could give you, you know, for example, spotted sea trout, you know, you know 9M, right near Palmetto Bluff. We know that they chorus on this side. We know that they're right around here somewhere, right? So the original idea, right, was to work with Matt Kimball with his Eris Explorer. I mean, it's basically a uh, multi-beam high-resolution sonar. Find the aggregation and then have the Aris Explorer set up so it's, so it's set up looking at the aggregation. Drive the boat over the chorus and see how they behave. The problem is we can't find the aggregation. We know it's chorusing here, right? We know it's chorusing here, but we can't find that. We did this all last summer. We can't find it. Like, and, I, and, and so what we think is happening is that the Eris is just too high resolution. Okay? So we're going to take a different step this year, and we're going to go broader and use a low resolution sonar, and then see if we can narrow in on the fish. And then go from there. And just see how, you know, and that's why we're doing the work at Woodell because we're going to actually expose them to playback experiments and just see how fish start behaving around noise. But you know, we know it's going to disrupt their behavior. Um, but we're going to use it. We're going to set up the Aris Explorer, and we're going to have a speaker that produces sounds, uh, motorboat noise first. And then you know, there's a lot of technical things that we've had to deal with, and you can talk to Eva about it. It's not as easy. And, and Aga and Bradshaw, you know, we had to first realize that, okay, boat noise clips our hydrophones. And it's too loud, so we have to get hydrophones that are not as sensitive. Because you've got to characterize your sounds in order to be publishable. you got to understand, you know, what the sound pressure level is, receive sound pressure level, and, and then also what the frequency bandwidth, you have to do all that stuff in order for it to be publishable. So we've been really trying to figure out what type of speakers to use and all that.